There is a house in New Orleans. Oh, hello, didn't see you there. Dane here, and today I'm gonna to be making a start on my review of Rising Sun by Michael Crichton, the author of Jurassic Park. As always, I'm gonna give you the blurb, then I'm gonna go through and check out some of my tabs before I share my overall thoughts and rating at the end, so. Dane reads. On the 45th floor of the Nakamoto Tower, the new American headquarters of the immense Japanese conglomerate in downtown LA, a grand opening celebration is in full swing. On the 46th floor, in an empty conference room, the dead body of a beautiful young woman is discovered. The investigation begins, and immediately becomes a headlong chase through a twisting maze of industrial intrigue, a no-holds-barred conflict in which control of a vital American technology is the fiercely coveted prize, and the Japanese saying business is war takes on a terrifying reality. So straight away, the Nakam Nakamoto building, it just makes me think of the Nakatomi Plaza from the Die Hard movies, which is also based on a book. Don't know which came out first. Roughly. Actually, this was 90... This was first published in 92, and I think Die Hard came out before that, so... Just a little bit of characterization here right at the start, um, which I thought was pretty good. And uh, they're talking about photos, and it's about how, you know, the photo just tells one story and it can be taken out of context, and I think we need to remember that in today's social media era. So we get, in the photos, my ex-wife plays a prominent role, holding the cake as Michelle blows out the candles, helping her unwrap the presents. She looks like a dedicated mom. Actually, my daughter lives with me and my ex-wife doesn't see much of her. She doesn't show up for weekend visitation half the time and she misses child support payments. But you'd never know from the birthday photos. Uh, we get a reference to her senpai, which I just know from YouTube and anime culture, even though I don't really watch anime. So we get, in Japan, he said, a senpai is a senior man who guides a junior man, known as a kohai. The senpai-kohai relationship is quite common. It's often assumed to exist whenever a young man and an older man are working together. They will probably assume it of us. And little clue here, because uh, again, somebody gets murdered, so... Uh, so she came with somebody, and evidently intended to leave with somebody too. Taxes can't break a hundred dollar bill, which is all she's got with her. And then someone gets uh, wasabi-covered peanuts, and um, the guy is like, never heard of them. He says, I don't know if they're sold outside Japan. They definitely are now. And uh, somebody here is talking about sexual desires, and uh, she says, it's completely natural to them. I mean, I don't mind a little golden shower or whatever, handcuffs, you know. Maybe a little spanking if I like the guy, but I won't let anybody cut me. I don't care how much money. And here's like a bit of the cultural differences between America and Japan. It's hard for an American to see him clearly, Connor said, because in America, you think a certain amount of error is normal. You expect the plane to be late. You expect the mail to be undelivered. You expect the washing machine to break down. You expect things to go wrong all the time. But Japan is different. Everything works in Japan. In a Tokyo train station, you can stand at a marked spot on the platform and when the train stops, the doors will open right in front of you. Trains are on time. Bags are not lost. Connections are not missed. Deadlines are met. Things happen as planned. The Japanese are educated, prepared and motivated. They get things done. There's no screwing around. And uh, we get this little bit as well, which I think is interesting because this problem's even worse now, like the correlation between income and property prices. Somebody asked a question and Morton nodded. Yes, it's true that our industry is not doing well. Real wages in this country are now at 1962 levels. The purchasing power of American workers is back where it was 30 odd years ago. And that matters, even to the well-to-do folks that I see in this room, because it means American consumers don't have the money to see movies or buy cars or clothing or whatever you people have to sell. The truth is, our nation is sliding badly. A, n a woman asked another question I couldn't hear and Morton said, yes, I said 1962 levels. I know it's hard to believe, but think back to the 50s when American workers could own a house, raise a family and send their kids to college, all on a single paycheck. Now both parents work and most people still can't afford a house. The dollar buys less, everything is more expensive. People struggle just to hold on to what they have. They can't get ahead. I just love this little description here at the start of this little chapter. Pasadena looked like a city at the bottom of a glass of sour milk. The jet propulsion laboratory on the outskirts of town was nestled in the foothills near the Rose Bowl. But even at 8.30 in the morning, you couldn't see the mountains through the yellow-white haze. And uh, Sanders says, America may lack engineers and scientists, but we lead the world in the production of lawyers. America has half the lawyers in the entire world. Think of that. He shook his head. We have 4% of the world population. We have 18% of the world economy. But we have 50% of the lawyers, and 35,000 more every year pouring out of the schools. That's where our productivity is directed. That's where our national focus is. Half our TV shows are about lawyers. America has become land of lawyers. Everybody suing, everybody disputing, everybody in court. After all, three quarters of a million American lawyers have to do something. They have to make their 300,000 a year. Other countries think we're crazy. 
Times haven't changed, have they? And then we get this character who's like a computer scientist or whatever, and we get, isn't she beautiful, Sander said, acting as if he took credit for it. Just beautiful. Yes, I said. Actually, I'm surprised you're not a model. That was an awkward moment. I couldn't tell why. Well, maybe it's because she's an intelligent professional woman, and you think that all there is to do about her is her beauty. And then, it turns out that she's missing an arm as well. So uh, that's why she's not a model. Otherwise, she would obviously be a model. You know, women can't have women using their brains in jobs, no. So uh, we get told here, I'm in my new location, by the way. I miss some tabs. We get told uh, all forms of photographic evidence, including video, are no longer admissible in court. Um, I haven't heard that, I said. It hasn't happened yet, Sanders said. The case law isn't entirely clear, but it's coming. All photographs are suspect these days. I'm pretty sure they are still admissible because the thing is, is you can find there are ways of telling whether something's been faked, you know? We get here, um, photographs always had integrity precisely because they were impossible to change. So we consider photographs to represent reality. But for several years now, computers have allowed us to make seamless alterations of photographic images. A few years back, the National Geographic moved the Great Pyramid of Egypt on a cover photo. The editors didn't like where the pyramid was and they thought it would compose better if it was moved. So they just altered the photograph and moved it. Nobody could tell. But if you go back to Egypt with a camera and try to duplicate that picture, you'll find you can't. Because there is no place in the real world where the pyramids line up that way. The photograph no longer represents reality. But you can't tell. Minor example. And we learn about bad blur. Bad blur is one of the things that can give away when uh, a video has been edited. Bad motion blur, Sanders said. Video runs at 30 frames a second. You can think of each frame of video as a picture that's shot at a shutter speed of 1 30th of a second. Which is very slow. Much slower than pocket cameras. If you film a runner at a 30th of a second, the legs are just streaks, blurs. And if you alter it by a mechanical process, it starts to look wrong. The image appears too sharp, too crisp. Edges look odd. It's back to the Russians. You can see it's been changed. For realistic motion, you need the right amount of blur. Actually, I think at least my camera shoots at 60 frames per second, but still. And I just love this little bit as well. Uh, you probably know that their Zen monks are expected to write a poem close to the moment of death. It's a traditional art form, and the most famous poems are still quoted hundreds of years later. So you can imagine there's a lot of pressure on a Zen Roshi when he knows he's nearing death and everyone expects him to come up with a great poem. For months, it's all he can think about. But my favourite poem was written by one particular monk who got tired of all the pressure. It goes like this. And then he quoted this poem. Birth is thus, death is thus. Poem or no poem, what's the fuss? So yeah, Rising Sun by Michael Crichton, pretty good thriller. Um, it did remind me quite a lot of Die Hard at a few points. Um, it also de definitely shows its age, and I think if it was written now, it would be uh, the Chinese rather than the Japanese taking over America. But it's still, um, I mean, it has its heart in these like xenophobic fears of them foreigners coming over here and buying up all of our real estate, you know? I'm not entirely sure what point Crichton was trying to make with it, but I think as long as you read it, I mean, I approached it with quite a liberal point of view, so, you know. But uh, yeah, it was still alright, probably a week 3.5 out of 5. So there we have it, that's what I made of Rising Sun by Michael Crichton. And as always, don't forget to let me know in the comments what you thought of this book, if you read it. Hit that like button if you've enjoyed this video. Hit that subscribe button for more, and I will see you soon for another bookish video. Thanks a lot. Bye-bye.